Yeah. I am Pamela Puleo's executive assistant, and I am very proud to be a member of the Concord Hospital Trust staff. I am pleased to welcome our in-person guest today. We're very excited to have you. Uh, and also to our friends, our dear friends, who are uh, watching this What's Up Doc remotely. <coughs> Uh, we are happy that the hospital restrictions now allow us to have up to 12 people in person to attend our What's Up Doc sessions, but we know that there are many more who um, we miss, and we look forward to uh, the future when things can really get back to normal. Today we are honored to have Dr. David Picard with us. Dr. Picard joined Concord Hospital staff in 1995. He attended the University of Vermont College of Medicine, and he did both his residency and his fellowship at the Maine Medical Center. Dr. Picard's specialties include pulmonary medicine and sleep medicine, and he holds board certifications in pulmonary disease, critical care medicine, as well as sleep medicine. Today, Dr. Picard's topic is sleep. Is it really overrated? I'm really looking forward to hearing this. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Picard. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Done a couple of these talks in the past. Always enjoy them, uh, enjoy the interaction. And it's nice to actually see people for a change without, uh, well, I guess we still have masks on, but uh, good to see folks. All right, so I'm um, going to do a talk today for about an hour discussing sleep. Um, Obviously, this is uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek. You hear people say all the time, it's really overrated, you know, it's not that big a deal. I can tolerate um, going without sleep. Um, spoil alert here, uh, if you don't want to know what my overall answer is, plug your ears, but I don't agree with that statement right there. Um, and I'm going to try to really whet your appetite is what I'm really going to try to do and just give you a bunch of little snippets, some background information, um, some examples of some research at a, at a very high sort of 10,000 foot level and hope that I can encourage people to um, look into this a little bit more. I'll, I'll put it up at the end, um, uh, the, uh, a reference, but it stimulated me a lot to, to do this talk and if you read the whole book and you go through it, you go, oh, he took that, oh, he took that, oh, he took that. Um, well, yeah, because this guy named Matthew Walker who's an MD, PhD, um, wrote a really great book. It's called Why We Sleep. It's 10 bucks on Amazon. And it'll take you about, I don't know, six hours to read. It doesn't take that long. And it's just full of really, really fascinating information. And he credits you know, most of the people that are doing the research. So if you really want to go and look more up and get some detailed information, it's there. And he's, uh, he has a lot of YouTube clips as well um, that I, I often recommend my patients go and, and look at if they don't want to um, uh, read a whole book, although it's a great way to cure insomnia in the middle of the night. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll show uh, that again at the end, but uh, I, I really would encourage people, I try to get everyone I, I know that's interested in reading it all to read this book because it's just fascinating. And the bottom line is, Sleep really touches every aspect of our life. Um, we spend a third of our life sleeping. So hopefully if we live to be 90 years old, right, we spend 30 years sleeping. And it's got to be important if you're spending that much time doing it, because evolutionarily we, just, we wouldn't be wasting our time doing nothing if it wasn't important. So what is sleep? It's, it's a reversible behavioral state where we're actually completely disengaged from our environment. We don't respond to it, we're not aware of what's going on. And um, in, in some of the uh, less complex animals, insects, worms, oysters, clams, things like this, that don't talk to us and can't interact so much, it's actually one of the ways they look to see and evaluate sleep, is looking at how much they're disengaged from their environment. And in fact, all of those creatures sleep. So um, that's an interesting fact to wait just to begin with. Sleep is actually very, very complex. There's a lot of different things going on. And uh, we still have many more questions than we have answers about sleep. We have four major biological drives in life for us to, to keep going. And the things that we're trying to do are get food to eat, to get fluids to drink, 
to reproduce, to keep our species going, and to sleep. These four things, we really, really uh, drive our lives. And if you put them in priority, it's probably drinking first, because you can't go very long without fluids. Um, but next is sleep, and then uh, eating and reproducing, as far as prioritizing what we do. So here's a couple of examples of sleep. My all-time favorite. If you've been to any of my lectures, I give a lot of lectures over the years. You'll see some of these pictures I keep reusing because I just, just, I just love the hunter. Um, I sleep while the deer is eating his food. Okay, so that on the on the superficial level, that's what sleep looked like. You're lying there, you're not responding. Um, you look like you're in a coma or maybe even dead, right? You're just, you're just lying there, but we keep recovering from it every day. We wake up and we become normal once again. How do we know whether someone is sleeping, you know, for sure? Or are they just lying there quietly? So we look at brainwave activity. And it wasn't actually until the early 50s that someone actually looked at brains when, they were, when people were asleep using EEG reads and started to see some different patterns, that there were different kinds of brain waves and they looked different in different areas of the brain and at different times of the night. I'm not going to go, you know, there's no, no quiz here on this, um, but just to give you a basic idea of what's going on, we're looking at brainwave activity. So it's how much, how much jiggling up and down do we see, and how big are the, uh, what we call the amplitude, how large are the waves. So the speed or the frequency of the brain waves and the amplitude of the brain waves are what help us uh, discriminate between the different stages of sleep. Um, and here we see awake, and then the things are slowing down a little bit, and that's stage one sleep, stage two sleep, we start to see some of these big complexes, it's called K-complex. And then slow wave sleep now actually has been uh, changed, the definition of that over the last few years. Uh, stage three and four sleep are now just stage three sleep. They got rid of stage four, uh, and they just basically combined them together. So it's a certain amount of amplitude and a certain amount of slowing of the brainwave activity, and you're in slow, slow wave sleep or deep sleep. So deep sleep is what you hear people talk about. It's kind of one of the holy grails of sleep. You gotta get to deep sleep and you gotta get to dream sleep because that's when it seems like a lot of the important things are going on. And then down at the bottom is dream sleep. And what you'll actually notice is dream sleep EEG pattern here looks very similar to wake. And in fact, when you are asleep and you're dreaming, your brain is super active. It's very, very active. Okay. Um, so another part of sleep is that this is not at all random. It's a pattern to it, and what we call sleep architecture, um, the name of this little graph here, we call them hypnograms, and basically this is a bit of a road map of your sleep at night. So first part of the night, you're awake, hopefully you're not lying in bed very long, you fall asleep, so you drop down to stage one sleep, and then a little bit later, hopefully you transition from stage one to stage two sleep quite quickly, and in the early part of the night, you drop down to stage three and stage four sleep, which is now just all stage three. Um, and you spend quite a bit of time there. After about 60 to 90 minutes, you pop into dream sleep, and then the process sort of repeats. Now in reality, there are frequently some awakenings going on during the night, very brief. Uh, so it, it's not this perfect stair step, step picture when we actually uh, produce the ones from our patients that have sleep studies, but it has this pattern to it. So the two really notable things here to look at is that there is a pattern, I guess three, there is a pattern and a sequence to it. The second is that this slow wave and deep sleep is in the first half of the night, and that dream sleep occurs four or five times during the night, but it becomes progressively longer and, um, and therefore basically is more of the whole percentage of the sleep uh, at night as we go toward the end of the night. Um, so Two-thirds of your dream sleep occurs in the last half of the night, so it's more dense with dream sleep. And that becomes important uh, when it comes to learning. Uh, if, if you think of the average person, it doesn't matter whether you're sleeping four hours or six hours or eight hours, this is basically the pattern you see. So if your alarm goes off an hour, hour and a half earlier than it should, because you're only getting six and a half or seven hours of sleep, what are you losing? You're losing REM sleep, dream sleep. You're losing maybe a quarter of it. Um, so that becomes important. So what is the purpose of sleep? So this is, you know, we recognize that people have been sleeping for thousands of years, 
but we really haven't figured this out um, in, in a meaningful way until fairly recently. <clears throat> the, the primary understanding of, of sleep up until, again, recently in the last decade or so had been uh, basically figured out from what happens if you sleep deprived people. And, and obviously they get sleepy, um, they tend to get sick. Uh, if you sleep deprived people enough over short periods of time and you prolong it, uh, they frequently um, become psychotic, have significant difficulties with depression and anxiety, uh, and it just is very negatively impactful on all aspects of your life. This is one of the reasons, unfortunately, you know, um, there are a fair number of countries in the world that interrogate prisoners by sleep depriving them because it basically breaks them down dramatically and very quickly um, over a week or so. <clears throat> So even acute sleep deficit here, um, one night can impact concentration, mood, dexterity, and a variety of other things which I won't get into. <clears throat> so how and how can we fix this? The only way you can fix this sleep debt, uh, as, as I call it, we call it, um, is by giving sleep back. So stimulants like caffeine and pharmaceutical stimulants improve wakefulness to some degree, but they never get you back to where you need to be. So I referred to, um, until recently, we didn't really know what was going on with sleep. And uh, about 10 years ago now, um, 10 to 15 years ago, it was a, a Danish researcher who figured out that um, there was a real interesting process going on in the brain. And you may be familiar with your lymphatic system. So we have arteries and, and veins that get blood out to the, the organs and, and the veins bring the blood back. And then there's these lymphatic channels that also collect fluids that have leaked out of the blood vessels. And it's basically like a drainage system to get it back into the circulation. Well, it turns out your brain kind of has the same sort of thing. And we didn't realize this. And what happens is these glial cells, and that's where the, the uh, glymphatics comes from, play a huge component of this. And there's these cells, and let me go back one. This is a glial cell, which is kind of a really cool picture, so I threw it up there. Um, so these glial cells basically surround blood vessels. And they end up, they have some channels in them that allow some of the cerebral spinal fluid to leak out. And it leaks out into the tissues um, in between all the different cells. So over here, obviously this is just a, a, a pictorial sort of representation of things. This isn't how it's all put together, but um, the, the neurons are out here and this cerebral spinal fluid is going around and, 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 and washing through. And neuron cells um, are the same as all other cells. They have waste products, so they have to get rid of byproducts of metabolism. And what happens is this, these materials sort of spill out of the cells and then the cerebral spinal fluid in the lymphatic system basically rinses it out and clears it out. What's really fascinating, what's really cool, is that um, this happens almost entirely when we're in deep sleep, stage three sleep, slow wave sleep, okay? And what they have found is that these glial cells basically kind of shrink and when they shrink, they basically generate more space around them, so there's more area for the, um, the fluid to wash all this uh, material away. The, the analogy they sort of use is uh, if you're in a big city, New York City, you've got all your dump and your garbage and stuff, and you keep it inside the building, and then after hours, they push the garbage outside, and the garbage trucks come in, in the middle of the night and they pick it up. So that's kind of what's happening in the brain with the byproducts and the waste products. But in addition, the buildings actually shrink. So now the roads get bigger so you can get more trucks in and get all the junk out faster. That's kind of the, the gross analogy to what's going on in the brain. So this was um, revolutionary and uh, really helped explain why certain parts of sleep, particularly the slow wave sleep, was so critical. All right, um, so what makes us awake or asleep? It's super complex. Um, there's a lot of chemicals that are involved. And the sort of the, the nucleus of the whole thing, the brain center is, uh, it's a bad term, I guess, uh, but is this little tiny uh, area here, suprachiasmatic nucleus, and it's, it's about the size of a pea, and your 
the optic nerves come from the eyes and they cross over and they go to the back of the brain and it's right at that crossover where this little nucleus sits, which also would make sense because we need to know when, when it's light, when it's dark, and so these, these messages are coming right through that general area. And <clears throat> there's two basic things that make us or determine whether or not we're gonna be awake or asleep. So the first one is the circadian rhythm. And that's basically our, our daily cycle, right? So we all kind of know that uh, in the morning, we generally feel pretty wide awake. If we're sleeping normally, we're not working night shifts, things like that. We feel wide awake in the morning. We often feel a little bit of a lull in the middle of the afternoon. Some countries of the world, they still do siesta time. Uh, and then as the evening comes on, we feel uh, much more tired. So that is in part our circadian rhythm. And um, that's the bottom picture down here. So where it's dark blue is where sleep is promoted. So in the middle of the night, up until around seven in the morning, we, our circadian rhythm is telling us to be asleep. Our internal clock is telling us to be asleep. Then we wake up, bright light exposure. Um, what's driving a lot of this rhythm is melatonin. And melatonin is produced during the night, during the dark hours, and it is shut off when uh, you're exposed to bright light. So your first exposure to bright light turns melatonin production off, and that's why it's so critical um, that we don't have people getting up in the middle of the night watching TV and playing video games and stuff because that bright light exposure is problematic. Um, so then during the day, we got all this bright light, our circadian rhythm uh, is, uh, the melatonin is suppressed, and as the darkness starts to come on in the evening, melatonin production goes up and we start to feel sleepy again. The other part of what determines us being tired or not is <clears throat> uh, basically a chemical in our brain called adenosine. And adenosine starts to build up as soon as we wake up in the morning. And throughout the day, it just keeps building and building and building and building and building and we get more and more and more tired as the levels go up. This is called uh, homeostatic pressure or process S in the sleep um, jargon. And it basically is just on a steep climb all day long, unless you were to take a nap. If you took a nap, you would see a drop and then it would start to climb back up again. But this is the, uh, what creates our sleep debt. You know, every day, every 24 hours, we feel more and more tired. And after about 16 or 18 hours is when we really, the adenosine levels get so high that we feel like we just have to sleep. Um, so when you put the two together, uh, that's why we feel so inclined to go to sleep late in the evening and hopefully feel refreshed in the morning. And I'm not gonna go into this here, but when we're working night shifts and split shifts and rotating shifts and all these things, these things get out of sync. And that's what creates a lot of the difficulties with um, shift work, uh, sleep disorder, and insomnia. All right, just a couple general quick things here. So on the bottom is age, zero to 90 years old or 80 years old, and then um, the amount of sleep that we get, the different stages of sleep. So we're just looking at two here. The top line is REM sleep. So when we're infants, we spend about almost 50% of the time uh, in dream sleep. And by our uh, 18, 20 year old time frame, we're down to about 20 to 25% and it stays there pretty much the rest of your life. Um, slow wave sleep is a bit different. We have a lot of slow wave sleep when we're young, when there's a lot of growth going on, and it just gradually declines over our entire lifespan. So when you get up into your 60s and 70s and 80s, we're seeing you know, very little uh, slow wave sleep, and that's all normal. Sleep efficiency, um, this is what percent of the time that you're in bed are you actually asleep? So as we all know, our teenagers and our folks in their young 20s, they sleep like rocks, they like to sleep, and they sleep you know, 95 to 100% of the night. As we get older, it is normal to not sleep as well. Our sleep becomes more fragmented and disrupted, and uh, this pattern is, is typical of both men and women. All right, so this is a little bit of a dangerous question. What is normal amount of sleep? Um, so, Normal is not necessarily what's recommended, all right? So a normal amount of sleep back in the 1800s, 1900s was nine or 10 hours of sleep per night. However, now, um, as time has gone on, we've seen this dip down. Average back in around 1960 was eight hours per night, and currently, unfortunately, today it's approximately six and a half hours. So this is a big problem. 
and it's very underestimated, and people really don't pay uh, due attention to it. So, National Sleep Academy, Sleep Foundation um, gives these as a general recommendations now for the amount of hours that people should sleep at various ages. I'm not going to read through all of them. You kind of know what the trends are. Um, a lot of people think that when you become elderly, 70s, 80s, 90s, your sleep requirements go way, way down. They really don't. They may, they may drop an hour. Some studies say they do, some studies say they don't. But we do know as sleep becomes more fragmented, there's much more tendency to nap during the day. So nighttime sleep tends to drop a bit. But when we're looking at these numbers here, we're really talking about total cumulative sleep over a 24 hour period of time. Uh, so, so our, our teenagers and 20 year olds should probably do more in the eight to nine, maybe even nine and a half hours, which virtually none of them get. So average sleep times, so this is just to kind of show up when, this is old data, 2001, right? 20 years ago, um, it was about almost seven hours, now we're down to about six and a half. A third of the uh, folks in this poll said that they slept eight hours a night, a third less than six and a half hours. Shift workers notoriously don't do well, uh, even though they try. And a Stanford poll from 2013 showed still about a third of individuals are getting uh, the eight hours recommended, but if you look at the people under six hours, six hours or less, it's up to 40%. And this is, you know, now seven years old. And the trends is nothing to indicate that the trends are actually getting better. They're probably getting worse as we go along. Uh, this is a recent poll from the National Sleep Foundation a couple of years ago, and they asked people to prioritize these five things and what would they rank them, you know, number one importance um, in their lives. And basically, uh, sleep gets pretty low attention. Um, I find it kind of interesting that 35% focused on fitness and nutrition when we know that the obesity levels are continuously climbing and a lot of people don't eat very well with a lot of fast foods. Yes? Why, why is the, uh, the sleep rocket? The amount of sleep is just that we're busier, it's more busy right. and, and more light exposure. So one of the big things is light, right? There's just light exposure all the time now, everywhere. If you go back, I mean, I wasn't around then, but if you go back 100 years, it was a much darker planet than we have now. Um, the other thing, you know, I remember when I was a kid, um, you know, you know grocery, uh, grocery stores weren't open on Sundays, and everything closed at 9 o'clock in the evening, and there were no 24 hour, or the rare, rare 24 hour gas stations to like truck drivers, you know, long haul truck drivers stuff. But we just live in a completely different society. Now, you know, there's people at Walmart all working all night long because they're stocking the shelves for you during the daytime. And you just see this pretty much across the board. Some things, you know, like firemen, policemen, doctors, and nurses, et cetera, they've always been working crazy hours. Um, but everybody else in the population has um, started doing the same thing, unfortunately. Are, yep. are some people just don't need as much sleep? And they, they feel fine, they, but they get along very nicely on five hours, maybe six hours? Yeah, so that's a good question, which kind of is uh, per perfect uh, dovetail into this next slide. Okay. <laughs> so there can be some differences between individuals. However, not really as much as people believe. So I, I work at the sleep center. It's all I do nowadays is talk to people about sleep. Everybody tells them, oh yeah, I'm just fine. I only get six, six and a half, seven hours of sleep. I do just fine. You know, I'm used to it, blah, blah, blah. And the bottom line is they've gotten used to feeling that way, but they're not well rested typically. And one of the most common questions people will ask me is, well, how much sleep do I really need? Because I do tell them that it ranges kind of from seven and a half to eight and a half, maybe nine hours. And it is cumulative. If, if, if you're a nine hour person and you're only getting eight, you feel it. If you do that consistently, you, you create sleep debt. Um, so I often tell people, I don't know exactly how much sleep you need, but here are some of the questions, right? So there are age related differences and there are differences from individual to individual. But if it takes you less than 10 minutes to fall asleep at night, you probably are not getting enough sleep. You probably have sleep debt. If you can't get going in the morning without drinking a cup of coffee, you have sleep debt. If you don't wake up in the morning without an alarm going off, feeling refreshed, you have sleep debt. Okay. Um, now, 
as I said, people get used to it, and you know, we can basically function for a long time on a half an hour less sleep or an hour less sleep than, than we should optimally be getting. But it is cumulative, and studies have shown when they look at performance in, in memorization, in learning, in response tasks, like you see a bright light, a, a blip on the screen and you have to touch a button, or if it's a yellow light or a red light, you have to touch two different buttons. When they do these sorts of tests with people, uh, performance just goes down as soon as you start sleep depriving yourself. So, can you do most of the stuff in life? Yes, but are you doing as good as you could potentially? And the answer to that is no. Okay. Um, so, sleep recovery. Um, if you are sleep deprived, what happens? Uh, so, you're going to get more sleep. If you, if you, if I sleep deprive you for two or three days, and then I let you sleep as much as you want, we see your total amount of sleep time go up. And we see a rebound the first night in non-dream sleep. And then nights two through four, we tend to see REM rebound. And it can take up to two weeks for people to get back to their baseline amount of sleep. Um, if you just put them in an environment where nothing is interfering with things, you know, they don't have to be at work, the phone isn't ringing, you know, the kids don't have to get off to school. Um, and uh, it takes a long time to, to pay this back but you will never actually regain all the sleep that you missed. All right, so I'm not, this is just, you can sort of read through these. Um, um, we're not gonna go through any of these in any depth at all. This is where we could be talking about sleep apnea or insomnia or chronic pain syndromes or you know, sleep schedules, work set habits, that sort of thing. But there's a lot of different reasons that we don't get enough sleep. But self-induced sleep restriction is one big one. Um, people, again, I'll, I'll sort of let people just read this instead of me going through each thing, but the bottom line here, because I want to get to some of the later slides, I got a lot of data here. Um, the bottom line is people report feeling tired and sleepy all the time. People complain about it, um, particularly at work and frequently, unfortunately, which is really dangerous when thriving, 51% of patients report thriving sleepy within the last year, okay, and 17% have dozed off while thriving. So that's a pretty scary number. You know, you go, well, you know, 17% is not that many, but if you think about just the math behind it, right, 17% is 17 out of 100. And if you drive from here to Boston, how many hundreds of cars do you go by? And all those people are potentially missiles heading in your direction. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so <clears throat> sleep debt impacts a lot of different things. Practically everything in your body, um, all aspects of your health. Um, and I'm gonna touch on a few of these here. Uh, cognitive impairment, one of the big ones. I'll go through these pretty quick. I've done these before if you've been at any of my other talks, but a lot of people are not aware of this. Uh, I thought it was fascinating when I was reading about it. So Three Mile Island in 79, Chernobyl 86, both uh, attributed to poor judgment, inadequate sleep, time of day, uh, as major contributing factors to these major, major disasters. A couple more, uh, the Exxon Valdez, um, the captain had only taken a cat nap after working 16 hours on the crew, then on a 22 hour shift uh, while loading the, the, the boat. Um, sleep deprivation is hugely impactful to us. And on a much more closer to home local uh, process or a thought process is the whole bit with sleepy driving. I'm not gonna pound on this yet. too much more. I mean, we kind of all know it, we just ignore it. Um, and you know, it doesn't matter who you are. One of my kids last night was like, oh, I'm gonna stay out late with my buddies tonight. You know, is that okay? And I'm like, if you're tired, call me and I'll come and get you. I will at least have a few hours of sleep when you call me and then I have to come and get you at you know three o'clock in the morning. Um, so it, everybody's doing it, um, but we just have to be really careful about it because it's so uh, impactful when it comes to sleepy driving. Um, there's about a death an hour, is what this works out to, in the United States um, related to sleepy driving. Um, when we get sleepy, one of the things that's interesting, is a lot like when we drink. We lose our ability to self-assess. We don't actually perceive just how sleepy we are. And uh, this is a big problem, so I always tell my patients, if you are driving and you feel like you're sleepy, you should tell yourself, I'm three times as sleepy as I actually think I am, because people can't self-assess. Um, when they've done um, 
testing with response time. So that was the type of thing I was telling you about hitting the, the, the button when you see the yellow light or the red light and hit the right button at the right time. Um, with, with one night of sleep deprivation, um, you are four times, it takes you four times as long to respond. And if you are four hours, three or four hours sleep deprived for a week, it's the same as if you've been awake one whole night. And the other problem that you get, so this is response time, but the bigger problem, and this is probably in the driving world, the bigger problem is microsleep. So what's a microsleep? Microsleep is when you're, you just kind of blink out, and I mean, we've, everyone's sort of done this. You're driving down the road, and it's like, oh, I don't remember going past that exit, or um, you're not paying attention if you're sitting back watching TV or something, or you just sort of, it feels like you just blinked for a second, and it may have only been a couple of seconds, but if you're driving and you're going 60 miles an hour, um, the problem is, is you're driving in a straight line, and if the road turns, you don't, and you just you don't respond at all. So risk of motor vehicle accidents with less than five hours of sleep is three times higher, and if less than four hours of sleep, it's 11 times higher. So this is not linear. Um, how about alcohol and sleep deprivation? So this is an interesting idea, because most people, when they're drinking, it's at night, in the evening. A lot of times people are coming home late, and what happens there? This is driving simulator data, okay? So the bottom line is, I mean, you're gonna guess the first couple anyways, right? No alcohol, you get enough sleep, you don't do much. If you get four hours of sleep and no alcohol, about six times as many events crossing the line or going off, hitting the rumble strip, that type of thing. If you have eight hours of sleep and you have alcohol, enough to make you legally uh, intoxicated, it's about the same. But how about the two together? Probably additive, right? Actually not. It's about 30 times higher. So it's, it's a multiplication factor of five or six as opposed to additive. So really, really important that none of us are out there drinking and driving late at night. Um, these are just some things. If you're driving and you feel like it's hard to focus, you're yawning, you get kind of irritable or fidgety, um, you can't remember exactly where you were the last couple of miles, that type of thing. Um, then you are sleepy and you need to get off the road, not push on uh, and try to make it to wherever it is you're going. Okay. So, now we're gonna kind of switch over a little bit to more about learning. And this is just a, a bunch of little uh, snippets here, but really interesting stuff. So we all have students, we were all students, or a lot of us were uh, at, at, you know, high school and college and, and graduate levels where you, you took a lot of exams and I love to pile a lot of information at you. So what did we do? We, we studied long and hard and we, we pulled a lot of all-nighters. <clears throat> that was pretty common practice. And um, this cramming process has actually been studied and it's been shown that it's probably the worst thing that you could possibly do uh, trying to get ready for an exam. Your, your ability to learn anything drops by about 40% when you have been up for a whole night. And <clears throat> what frequently happens too is students will um, be sleep deprived because they've been doing this all along so you're not really ready to learn. Then they stay up all night trying to learn and they don't learn very well. And then the other part of it is the consolidation of the learning that we do. And what's some really fa fascinating studies that have been done that look at learning tasks. So if you learn a task in the morning and you get tested on that task in the evening, you'll get a certain score. And you know, most people do fairly well, they can learn the task. What's really fascinating though is if you learn a task in the morning, you take a nap in the afternoon and you get retested in the evening, you do better. If you learn the task in the morning and you sleep overnight and you get tested the following day, you do even better. And if you learn the task in the morning and you sleep for two nights and then you get tested, you do even better. So we are processing data that we have taken in and learned on a nightly basis for several days. And so not only do we have to be teed up and well rested to learn, um, we have to have sleep afterwards to transition that data that we have accumulated in our heads from short-term memory to long-term memory. 
Uh, that was just a graphic for that 40% reduction in learning. So here's another thing I think is really interesting. Um, so my wife's a school nurse. Um, I've had kids going to school forever, and we all know that, um, particularly the teenagers, they hate getting up to go to school first thing in the morning. It's very hard for them to do. And they're not just being a pain in the neck about it. There's this normal sleep, uh, uh, delayed sleep phase that happens in about three to four hours duration as, as kids turn get into their teenage years. And they want to sleep later and get up later, and it's a natural part of their circadian rhythm and part of the growth process. Um, and we do everything in our possible power to suppress that, basically, now our education system. So there's this um, <coughs> town, city in, in Minnesota, Edina, Minnesota, and one of the things they did that was really fascinating was they moved their start time for high school students from 7.25 to 8.30 in the morning. And then um, some researchers looked at their SAT scores in the top decile of patients taking the exams. And they looked at the difference between um, wake up time or school start time of 7.30 and 8.30, which basically means the kids getting an, an extra hour of sleep. And what they saw was that there was a 16% increase in SAT scores in the patients just by shifting sleep time. So that's the difference between getting into the, your reach school or your non-reach school. That's the difference, you know, in potentially being very successful, maybe not even getting into school at all. Um, a lot of people spend a lot of money on these programs and courses to teach the children how to take, you know, teach to the test so you can do better on your SATs. And we can do, uh, mark, markedly improve their scores by just getting them to, to if we could get the school systems to go uh, to a later start time. However, super difficult to do because of a million different reasons which you're all familiar with, buses and people having to get to work, et cetera, et cetera. But it's pretty fascinating information. And this has been, this has been looked at uh, a couple other times and, and they've seen the same thing. Uh, it's not just this one place, this one freak instance. The other thing that was really interesting is just generally across the board, grades increased, behavior issues decreased, tardiness went down, absenteeism went down, and there was a much lower incidence of um, depression in these folks, and um, some studies have, have even showed a reduction in suicidal ideation. And all those things, by the way, if you noticed, are climbing, right, over the last 20 years. All these things are getting worse, mm -hmm. and we're all getting less sleep. So here's an interesting one. <clears throat> if you sleep deprive yourself, um, it is gonna impact your appetite. You are going to want to eat more, and you tend to want to eat carbs, high carbohydrate foods. Um, there's a couple chemicals in our body, there's lots and lots of them that control diet and appetite and things like that. But two of the big ones are ghrelin, um, and that stimulates appetite, and leptin, and that uh, creates a satiety feeling, a, a sensation of fullness. So um, I always remember it, ghrelin makes your stomach growl. <laughs> so the ghrelin goes up, the leptin goes down, and what that does is it increases your appetite. And what they've done in looking at patients, uh, and they've done very controlled scenario situations where they control the sleep, and they control the food that they're taking in, and they've done this over like a week's time, counted every calorie, all this sort of thing, tracked their activity levels, so it wasn't like some of the people were jogging and the others weren't doing anything. <clears throat> and what they basically found is that you average about 300 calories more intake per day if you're sleep deprived, and you tend to want carbs. And almost everybody I know, I'm certainly in that boat, um, when I'm working nights, uh, and I've, it's three in the morning, four in the morning, you know, you'll just like eat anything, and you're hungry. Um, and I hear it all the time from, from the nurses, you know, here at the hospital. Very common. Um, <clears throat> so, metabolic changes. So we just talked about the, the weight and appetite. Um, oh, I, one other thing I wanted to mention on that one. I thought I'd put it on here, maybe not. Um, so let's say you are overweight and you decide that you've had enough of this and you're gonna diet and you're going to drop 20 or 30 pounds. If you're sleep deprived, it makes it harder to do that because of this whole thing here. <laughs> But the other thing that's really interesting is when we lose weight, <clears throat> most people don't think about it, but you don't just lose fat. When you lose weight, you tend to lose fat and muscle because those are really the two stored uh, reserves we have of energy in our body. 
And you know, usually it's actually pretty close to 50-50, maybe 40-60. Um, when you're sleep deprived, 70% um, of the pounds you lose will be muscle, 30% fat. So it's really, really hard to get in good shape, you know, and be a bodybuilder. Um, it's interesting, you know, these guys that are bodybuilders, man, they sleep, they eat protein, they are actually pretty focused on what they're doing because this, this, this stuff has been known for a long time. Okay, um, so we just talked about um, the, the appetite increase. If you take patients and you sleep deprive them down to four hours of sleep per night for a week, these are healthy people with normal blood sugars and everything, you basically create a pre-diabetic situation. Blood sugars go up, and if you went to the doctor and you didn't tell them that you'd been doing anything funny and they did the blood work on you, your sugars are gonna be up, your hemoglobin A1C is gonna be up, and you may very well be diagnosed as pre-diabetic because you're four hours short on sleep per night for a week. <clears throat> uh, oops, there's a, I did put it in, I just forgot where I put it in. So there's, that's what I was just saying. Um, jump on to cardiovascular disease. So in 2011, sorry, there was a study it reported out, <clears throat> and they looked at 500,000 patients over eight countries, and they looked at patients with low total sleep time, that's what TST is, your total hours of sleep per day, and it showed a 45% increase in risk of cardiovascular disease. Pretty big number. Japanese study, 4,000 males over 14 year period, less than six hours of sleep per night, four to five times the risk of cardiac arrest. Less than six hours of sleep in patients over 45 years old resulted in a 200% increase in the risk of heart attacks. Um, they now, you know, they've done studies like this looking at <clears throat> calcification of the coronary arteries. It's very easy to image this now with CAT scanning and you can, you can measure the differences between individuals that are getting enough sleep and not getting enough sleep. Um, <clears throat> there's that one right there. And then this is a really kind of a cool thing too. Um, <clears throat> this is definitely directly out of the book I was telling you about. So daylight savings time. Every year, right, we do the same thing in the United States and a lot of countries around the world, like billions of people. And in the, in the, in the fall, we, um, what, go back, fall and back. spring, go forward. Spring forward, fall back. So what you look at is when you spring forward in the spring, you lose an hour of sleep. And in the fall, you gain an hour of sleep. And if you look at the statistics on myocardial infarction, heart attacks, in hospitals reporting the data, there is about a 23 to 25% increase in heart attacks the day after um, daylight savings time. Wow. And in the fall, it drops by 22 to 24%. Year after year. Crazy, right? I mean, it's just nuts. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that's been looked at and, and shown. Now, what what is, you know, it's just a one kind of, maybe it's just a one freakish little thing, but um, if you look at those individuals over, over the week, there doesn't seem to be much change over the, over the totals for the whole week, but that one day of sleep deprivation seems to have an impact. And, and it's probably related to heart rate and blood pressure and, and things like that, stress. Can I ask a little bit about that cardiovascular disease one? Sure. So I thought, I wonder how snoring impacts that. Because I, somewhere I read that if you snore, yeah, so <clears throat> snoring probably what, what, what that article or whatever what you were reading was referring to probably is the relationship of snoring with sleep apnea. So as far as we know, actually snoring is only really detrimental to the bed partner. Unless they start punching you, then it's detrimental to you. Um, so we don't think snoring actually seems to impact much of anything, but it's very, very common for people that um, snore to have sleep apnea. Um, if you look at the population, two thirds of the population snores, and about 15 to 20 percent of the population has sleep apnea. So you can certainly snore and not have sleep apnea, but virtually everybody that has sleep apnea snores, and um, it's the sleep apnea that actually contributes. And it's probably a combination of things. A, sleep deprivation, which we're talking about, 
but it's also the awakenings repetitively during the night from the inability to breathe um, create a lot of uh, excess stimulation on what's called the sympathetic nervous system, which is what controls our blood pressure and our heart rate, and core body temperature, our cortisol levels go up, there's a lot of different things that happen. But snoring in and of itself doesn't cause bad sleep, except the partner. For the partner, right. All right, um, <clears throat> so Alzheimer's disease, we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, pretty interesting. Um, area uh, of sleep research. So what's been sorted out or figured out, one of the things that you see in patients that have Alzheimer's disease, if you do uh, MRIs, is that there's these little deposits of protein in the brain that are often referred to as plaques. And the material that makes up this plaque is what's called beta amyloid. And beta amyloid is a byproduct uh, of the neurons uh, in the brain. And it's one of those things that's supposed to get washed away with, through this lymphatic system that we talked about. So the glial cells shrink down. This is one of the byproducts that's supposed to get rinsed down the drain. And, uh, and if that happens, then, then good, it's gone. But if it doesn't drain, get drained away, then it can start to build up. And it, it's basically toxic to the neurons, the, the, the nervous system cells that are around it. And it causes damage to them. So um, what's been found is when you look at individuals that have uh, Alzheimer's and they have this beta amyloid going up, one of the areas which is most impacted by it is the frontal cortex, the middle of the upper part of the front of your brain. And what's interesting is that's actually the area of the brain that controls the non-REM or the slow wave sleep. And when you see a lot of uh, beta amyloid, in that area, it correlates with those individuals having poor sleep, fragmented sleep, and less slow wave sleep. And what's interesting is you can see this pattern emerge. So now you have a problem that's um, being, being um, generated out of that section of the brain, the frontal cortex. More amyloid gets pr produced because you're not getting as much sleep, it gets deposited there, which fragments the sleep further, which makes less of it get washed out, so you have more accumulation in that same space, and so it becomes a self-perpetuating process. Is that kind of clear, or is that not clear? Um, and what's really fascinating, too, is, um, so the, the beta amyloid is clear from the lymphatic system we'll be talking about. Alzheimer's patients has less slow wave sleep, so less clearance. So you get more accumulation in that area. Um, and, and what's interesting is the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain where we do most of our learning and most of our memory processing, and that area doesn't actually get affected by the amyloid. So if that part of the brain, which is about memory, doesn't get affected by the amyloid, then why do people with Alzheimer's have such difficulty with memory? And what, they, what people are starting to think is it actually may have a lot more to do with the fact that their sleep is so terrible that they can't process things that they learn and transition them in from, from uh, short-term memory to long-term memory. Uh, but the long-term memory, they, people remember, frequently remember things that happened a long time ago, but can't remember where the car keys are. Exactly. Okay because that's already been deposited there and that doesn't get injured. It's the creation of new memory that's the problem with Alzheimer's. Um, only got a couple minutes left, I just wanna show you a couple other things. So immune function. <clears throat> um, when you don't get enough sleep, you have your immune system is significantly impacted. And it's kind of funny, the one thing I've been, you know, I've been, like everybody else for the last five months, we've been hearing all this stuff about COVID-19 virus, 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 we don't have any treatment for it, and it's gonna be a long time before we get a vaccine, and blah, 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 all this stuff. And you know, the one thing I haven't heard anybody say is make sure you get enough sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's probably one of the, I mean, we don't have much to fight it with right now, so it's probably one of the more important things, and I haven't heard nobody say anything about it. I even emailed Sanjay Gupta, and he didn't, uh, <laughs> I don't think he said anything about it. But at any rate, 
Um, so <clears throat> what's really interesting, they've done studies where they took um, college students and they, um, you know, they have to have the hep B and they have the A vaccines before they can live on campus and all this sort of stuff. And so the ones that didn't have it, they gave them their vaccinations. And half the group, they sleep deprived and half the group, they didn't sleep deprived. They only sleep deprived them for two, one or two nights. They gave them hep B vaccine and they had a 50% reduction in their immune system response to the vaccine from being sleep deprived for two nights. Another interesting thing when we're talking about the COVID vaccine coming out, right? Quality control, does it work or doesn't it work? Maybe it matters if the patients that are getting it are getting sleep. Hopefully those guys are smart enough to figure that out. Um, you're more susceptible to viral infections. They've done studies, they got people to volunteer to get flu, uh, you know, uh, viral, uh, common cold, rhinovirus kind of stuff, squirted up into their nose and then measured uh, symptoms of <clears throat> Uh, infections such as mucus production and fever and all these different things and they found that you're more susceptible no big surprise right you've been told since you were this big get enough sleep so you stay healthy this was a really interesting one I thought um, when this came out a few years back now increased risk of cancer so <clears throat> for breast colon prostate and uterine cancer um, there's a significantly elevated risk of developing these cancers if you're not getting enough sleep um, Breast cancer, I think, is 30% higher. And um, the reason for this is that, you know, what is cancer? Can cancer is when you have a normal cell in your body that mutates, something happens to it, and, and its growth pattern goes awry, and then it just grows and grows and grows uncontrollably. Thankfully, our immune system is basically out surveilling all of our tissues throughout our body all the time, 24 hours a day, and it, and it sees the ones that aren't right, and it picks them out and it kills them. And there's these cells called natural killer cells that do this. And um, when you develop a cancer that becomes clinically relevant, it's that you know we our immune system was not able to uh, control this and suppress it or kill it. It's one of the reasons why patients that have been on a lot of immunosuppressive agents for a long time, like transplant patients, or patients that have had previous cancers and had a lot of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, their immune systems aren't as good, and they're more prone to get more cancer. So our immune system is basically what protects us from ourselves developing cancer. And when your immune system doesn't work as well, you're at a higher risk to develop cancer. And that's been shown. The World Health Organization now considers shift work at night to be a possible carcinogen. That's what they, they've basically ranked it as a possible carcinogen if you work nights. Um, there's a natural killer cell. So um, if you restrict sleep for four hours one night, you drop your natural killer cell activities by 70%. All right, and I just made it underwater. So <clears throat> I know that was really fast, kind of burned through a lot of stuff. There's a lot of questions. Uh, you could spend an hour on each slide, you know, to dissect down and look at all different things. Uh, but it's really fascinating um, uh, area right now. I, I think, I mean, I'm into sleep, so I like it, but I think it's like some of the easiest, most interesting stuff to read out there compared to you know, a lot of the medical journal things that I, I've read over the years. Um, I'm getting no kickback from this guy, okay? Um, I just think he's, it, it's like such a good book, and if you, um, and if you go on like YouTube and just put his name in, um, he's got, a, a ton of, of uh, talks up there. And you'll just see he's a really engaging um, uh, speaker and, and fun to listen to. So I'm done talking. I'll take any questions that anybody might have. And uh, So if, if you're looking at that, I start very early when it comes to patterns of sleep. Yep. And as you get later in the night, you have that great dream sleep. But you don't make it quite there waking up at 2.30 or 3 every single night. What is that? Does that mean you haven't gotten into sleep because you never got to the dream? No, so it cycles. It's about 90 minutes for these okay. cycles. So <clears throat> you're going to sleep, um, if you fall asleep, and even if, let's say, you lay there for an hour and a half and you can't fall asleep, which you shouldn't do, but that's another lecture, um, and you finally <laughs> fall asleep, if you sleep for two hours, you're going to get some deep sleep and you're going to get some dream sleep. And if you wake up because you're going to go to the bathroom, 
you're going to start the process over and over. So you will get some dream sleep and some slow wave sleep each night. It's just, you know, how much you get total. What's the effect of exercise in both the quality and quantity of sleep? Yeah, so good question. So exercise um, is another one of the things I tell everybody they need sleep and I tell everybody they need exercise because exercise is good for almost everything. It's one of the few things that actually will increase your amount of slow wave sleep, deep sleep. Um, I actually don't remember the exact numbers now, but I think if you take someone that's not in any kind of an exercise program and you put them on some kind of a, it doesn't have to be super rigorous, just a regular exercise program. Their slow wave sleep, I think, goes up like by 10% or so, 10 or 15%, which is, you know, it's not huge, but there's not, it's really hard to increase slow wave sleep. All the drugs that we use to help people to sleep don't. They actually, almost all of them tend to suppress slow wave sleep and dream sleep, which are the two that we really want to get the most of. Um, particularly the, a lot of the sedatives that we use to help people with insomnia, they tend to promote stage two sleep, which is good sleep, it's important sleep, but it's not the, the deep sleep and the dream sleep. Um, all the, the one thing I've never seen anybody write about, I gotta look into more, and this fellow doesn't talk about, is dream sleep appears to be really, really important. Virtually every antidepressant that we use suppresses dream sleep. And I'm not against, you know, I think the, the, you, know, you need antidepressants if you, you know, you can't function and you have suicidal thoughts and things like that. People need these medications. But I do think a lot of um, antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications are probably a bit over-prescribed. And I, I just wonder how much it's impacting sleep quality in general. Um, it's another good thing, actually, about exercise. Um, there have been studies that have actually shown if you take patients that are going to be, be started on uh, an antidepressant medication and you put half that group on an exercise regimen and you put the other half of the group on drug, the people that exercise actually have more improvement in their depression than the people that take drug. Um, what they didn't do in that study, it was, a German, I think it was a German study quite a while back, I would have loved to have seen them split it into three groups where there was drug, drug and exercise, and just exercise as opposed to drug versus exercise. But because you probably get even better results with the combination. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Just a quick yeah. question. So I think what I'm hearing you say in this is uh, you need to hear people say they've worked, they stayed up late all week or whatever, and I'm going to catch up on the weekend. So you may have a longer sleep and, and feel better, but you're actually all those things behind the scenes, you're not catching up on that. Right. That's it. Basically, when they've done studies to look at, you, you specifically quantify the amount of sleep debt, and then you quantify the amount of sleep recovery. You never quite get all of that back. There's no question that, you know, you do feel better. I mean, tons of people will tell you that they, they feel better on Saturday and Sunday than they did, uh, than they do on Thursday or Friday because they, they've been short sleeping themselves during the week. So you do get benefit, but you just never get it all back. We have a question on Facebook from Pat. She asks, what are your words of wisdom for Parkinson's patients trying to sleep and have tremors? Okay, so that so that's a difficult. And I think the I'm sort of describing, you know, what we know happens. Uh, Parkinson's patients are well known to have really, really difficult times with their sleep. And um, and, and I don't manage Parkinson patients specifically, um, so I'm not sure exactly what the neurologists tell folks. But the, the basics are, is we, we want people to try to avoid medications, sleeping pills, that type of stuff if we can, because they don't really seem to help sleep quality and the, and the deep sleep and the dream sleep that much. And the most important things are trying to keep folks on a, on a sleep schedule, a good regimen. and. Um, one of the problems as people get older, and particularly I see it when people are retiring, they go from a very structured environment of, I gotta be at work at this time, and I gotta pick my kids up at this time, and dinner's at this time, etc. And all of a sudden, all that's kind of gone. And well, I can sleep in late one day, and get up early another day, and I'll take a nap on this day, because it doesn't really matter. And when you start to lose that structure, sleep quality almost always um, gets worse, decreases. 
So I think keeping a really good sleep regimen uh, is going to be important and then working with the neurologist to optimize the medications to try to control the tremors. But it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the biggest issues with folks that have uh, Alzheimer's disease as it becomes more progressive and more advanced. Insomnia is a huge difficulty and then they tend to be up roaming around the house and the caregivers at home are getting sleep deprived because they can't sleep at night either and it becomes a huge stressor. Thank you. Would you recommend melatonin to help you sleep? Because you did discuss that. So melatonin is an interesting medication. Um, we, we use it here at the hospital to help facilitate sleep, trying to stay away from the, the Valium-based hypnotic type medications. Um, there's not a lot of great data that actually shows melatonin has a big impact on sleep. However, I will tell you that I have many, 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 many patients that swear up and down that melatonin has been very, very helpful and impactful for their sleep. And so I never tell people, oh, don't take that because it, there's no scientific data that says it helps. Because we're all different people and we have different chemistry and it impacts us in different ways. Um, if, if, if people are interested in trying melatonin, I, I don't tell them not to but I'm never super optimistic that it's gonna have a big impact on them. Um, we do use melatonin for a couple different things in sleep medicine. We prescribe it for uh, something called REM sleep behavior disorder. We, we can actually shift people's circadian rhythm around with it a little bit if they're having difficulties with this delayed sleep phase syndrome or band sleep phase syndrome. Um, you could theoretically even use it to help uh, decrease jet lag and things like that. Um, but as a specifically as a sleep aid for insomnia, um, it doesn't tend to work very well. What about aromatherapy? So you know we also use that too. Does it have any changes after sleep? So I don't know the I don't know the scientific literature on aromatherapy or if there is any. Um, I think what we're trying to do when we go to sleep at night is we're trying to find a way, a mechanism that we can relax, that we can feel comfortable, and that we can sort of settle in to get ready to sleep. And for some people, you know, aromas are very powerful. Um, uh, they can have a big impact. You know, you smell certain things and it can bring back a memory, good ones and bad ones, just like that. And uh, so our, our nose is very sensitive to these things. And uh, like lavender is frequently used. Um, and I think if that helps an individual, I'm all for it. Um, you know, it's like meditation. I, I tell a lot of people, I'm a fairly big proponent of trying to get people to look into meditation and use that because the biggest problem most of us have with, with insomnia is it's sleep schedules and it's our brains. You know, it's, it's, we're too worried, we're too anxious, we're too frustrated about things and trying to turn that stuff off and settle down is what we need to figure out how to do. And so there's a, it just you know, a variety of different ways for people to approach that. So I think aromatherapy can work, you know, uh, getting, you know, if you've got someone at home that can give you a massage at night and help you relax fine. Uh, hot tub baths can be good. Uh, when you increase your core temperature from soaking in a hot, hot tub for a while uh, and then you get out of the tub, when your core temperature starts to drop, it actually makes you feel sleepy. So it's one of the reasons people feel really sleepy when they get out of hot tubs and things like that. Um, so any of those things can be effective, potentially. Okay, All right. I want to thank you, Dr. Picard, for a very enlightening and very uh, helpful presentation for all of us. And uh, thank you again to our uh, uh, guests that have uh, remoted in and joined us today. Uh, we wish you a great weekend and a healthy and happy rest of your summer. And uh, be looking for my email regarding our September What's Up Doc uh, series. Uh, Dr. Stacy Perlman will be here as our speaker and she will be talking about new treatment options for acid reflux. Thanks again.